You know that feeling where you go into a painting and you're confident and you're excited and you're like, everything is gonna go my way. And then you get to the painting. Yeah, I know that feeling. I think every artist knows that feeling. And today I wanna to talk about why that happens. Because it's really easy to be able to look back at that painting and think, God, there must be something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not as good as I thought. But having coached artists through literally hundreds of paintings, I have found that this is rarely the case. That's right, I am here to tell you, it's not you, it's your reference. And that's what I wanna talk about today. How you can identify whether or not your reference is what set you up to have a frustrating painting and where you can go from there. So for today, I'm going to be sharing my process of working on a painting that I am pleased with. But it was absolutely a tricky one. In fact, I was working on the kind of painting that I most often warn people against studying. If you want to get good at portraits and you are working on your value skills or your color mixing, this is exactly the kind of portrait I always encourage artists to avoid until you are so secure in your way of working and you're so confident that you can really give this kind of composition everything you've got. And that is doing a painting that is backlit or has rim lighting, as this particular portrait does. And I'm going to use this to talk about the most common problem that I see in choosing reference, and that is the lighting of your reference. So if you have made a painting that just did not go the way that you expected and it has you wondering if maybe you just got lucky this whole time and you're not really as good as you think you are, let's start with this question. How is your subject lit? In general, I find the easiest lighting situation for successfully painting a portrait and capturing a likeness is one where you have probably three quarters to two thirds of the face in the light and your light and shadow pattern is very clear. You have very distinct edges between the light areas and the shadow areas, like in this example. Now, this example is a little bit unusual because we have shadows being cast by her fingers but I think this gives you a really clear indication of just how hard the light is. And you can get this impression that even if her hands weren't being held above her head here, that you would probably see really clear shadows in the eye socket area. And of course we see very clear shadows under the nose, under the lower lip, and of course um, encapsulating or encompassing the neck. This tends to be the most approachable lighting situation for portrait painting because it helps you to break up the drawing in a really clear way. The transitions between the light and shadow aren't so subtle that you get sucked into lots of blending and shading that ultimately reads as somewhat ambiguous. And typically painting this light and shadow pattern, it just makes sense to our brains. By contrast, take a look at the painting that I'm working on here. Almost her entire face is in shadow and the areas that aren't, it's still a really fuzzy distinction. So if you look at that cheek that to us is on the right, it's definitely reading as being more in the light than something like her jaw, but it's not really clear where it starts being in the light and it stops being in shadow. Even something like the rim lighting on the very edge of her face is very subtle. On top of that, you know, rim lighting or backlighting is oftentimes really tricky for us because it, it sucks our brains in to wanting to change the value structure that we are looking at. So it's really, really easy when we look at a reference that isn't lit from straight on, where the majority of the face is in shadow, for us to try and artificially lighten the face and pretend that there is light hitting it. It leads us to change the value structure, it leads us to mix up 
different color. Um, and oftentimes we just lose a lot of the landmarks of the face in that process. Now, here is a lighting situation that is something in the middle, and that is overcast lighting, where we don't really have a clear distinction between light and shadow at all. In this image, we have a general sense of where the light's coming from because we can see a shadow that's being cast by the jaw onto the neck, and we can see areas that are lighter than others, something like the bridge of the nose, the tip of the nose, versus the underside of the nose. Same thing with where we see the light hitting the lips. But there's just not a lot to go on here. I find that this, combined with images where the entire face is in shadow, these present really similar challenges. The difficulty here is that while we might see areas that are relatively lighter or darker, it feels really ambiguous and we often get really sucked into just going into the facial features rather than describing the form through light and shadow. It also tends to feel like we are just left to our own devices for more of the face as a result. And what I mean by that is that the face isn't broken up by any shadow shapes that helps us to really better understand how their proportions relate to one another. And as a result, with these pieces where either the entire figure or face is in shadow or the entire face is in the light, it's really easy for us to really lose sight of our proportions and start to put features in the wrong places. Now, somewhere in the middle here is a reference like this one, where we do have a sense of light and shadow, but it's a very gradual transition between the two. This is where we get into that situation where it's a little bit easier than the examples I just gave, but that transition between light and shadow is so sloping. It's, it's arrived at so gradually that it's really hard to say exactly where the light ends and the shadow begins. And that can kind of create the same pitfalls as with the previous example. And as I mentioned before, it can really get us into the situation where we're fixated too much on blending and rendering and we lose some of the structure or we start to create mud on the canvas as a result. And these are the most common reasons that I see for a reference not working. It tends to come down primarily to the lighting and as a result, the value structure. Now, other reasons that a reference might not work would be, for example, you just don't have enough color information and you're trying to make it a colorful painting rather than simply copying the color that's in that reference. You also could have taken the photo from an iPhone and really get in that situation where the face feels really close to the camera and as a result, there's a little bit of distortion in the facial features. These I think are really common when you have images of family that you would really love to paint, but you snapped them before you really were diving into your skills as an artist. And thus it's not like you had a full photo shoot with a camera that was purpose built. And instead you really want to paint this sentimental moment versus creating an image that you know you are going to respond to and it's going to be really well suited for a painting. For this particular piece, I'd say I was kind of middle of the road. I knew this would be a challenge because I have coached enough artists through working with really difficult references like these. And at the same time, I think a little bit of hubris got to me as well. And I thought to myself, I'll figure out how to solve it in the middle of the painting. If you ever have that thought, <laughs> if you ever have that thought, you are mistaken. Ask me how I know. Every time I have gone into a painting thinking, I don't know what I'm gonna paint for the background, but I'll figure it out. Or I don't know how I'm gonna overcome the fact that Basically all of the face is in shadow and none of it is the color that I really want. I'll figure it out. You are going to be very lucky if you come away with a painting that you are happy with at the end of that. 
I think that's one of the easiest ways for you to tell that your reference isn't setting you up for success. Now, here's what really did help me with this particular piece. Before I started, I took a look at my reference and I compared it to my vision board of the kinds of paintings that I know I really want to make. And I asked myself if there were any paintings on this board that had a similar lighting scheme. And while there weren't any that jumped out to me from my board, there were some paintings from the artists who appear on my board. And I could use that as a guide. I could use that to show me what kinds of color choices might be appropriate. I used it to really give me permission to paint the values as I saw them. And it led me to envision what this final painting might actually look like, which is a really big deal. That whole idea of running into trouble because you tell yourself, I'll figure it out while I'm at the easel. This happens because when you sit down to plan your piece, you don't have a clear idea of what the entire painting is going to look like at the finish. And this, I think, is the biggest predictor of whether or not you're going to have a successful painting that you're happy with at the end of the day. So let's imagine that in making this piece, I was not happy with the end result. Here's what I would go ahead and do from there. First, I would go back through the examples that I just gave, and I would ask myself if any of those sound like the situation that I found myself in. And if the answer is yes, the main takeaway I'm going to have is that I was not set up for success with this painting because of the reference, not because of my skill level. And I am going to tell myself that I cannot read further into it than that, because I can't tell you how many times I have spoken to artists who encounter this issue and have a full on crisis of confidence because of it. And that isn't fair to yourself. The next thing I would do is I would go ahead and ask if the photo was just generally of a good enough quality to work from. So typically this is gonna disqualify something like a photo that you took off of your iPhone. If there's not good color or it's grainy or blurry, or if the subject was just too close to the camera lens, honestly, you're probably going to be better off restaging that photo and taking it with a slightly better camera. Or, of course, working from life. And if your photo did happen to be of a solid quality, but you had some kind of issue as far as the lighting, I would see if you can go ahead and make your job a little bit easier by seeing if you can have slightly harder shadows and if you can make sure that you have a really nice balance between light and shadow on the face. So typically this looks like having more light than shadow, but at least a quarter, if not a third of the face in shadow. That's gonna help you to break down the face a little bit more clearly and make sure that your proportions are all in check. And finally, if you set out to paint and you're looking at your reference and you realize, wow, I really wanted to make something that wasn't just a copy of this reference or an interpretation of this reference. If you look at your reference and you think, I really wanted to add something from imagination, or I wanted to paint different color, or I wanted to try and change the lighting, or I wanted to abstract the background, that is another issue entirely. In my experience, we are going to be set up most for success when we have a clear plan for what that deviation needs to be. Most of the time, whatever it was we wanted to change, we actually really want to change that when we're gathering the reference. So putting the model in a different environment, changing their clothing, these things are all things that when possible, we just, we want the reference to go ahead and have those things rather than us having to solve that problem when, we're, when we are in front of the canvas. The next thing might be if you wanted to abstract something or make something more graphic or simplified. Well, if that is the case, then you might need to spend some time thumbnailing or manipulating your reference until it really does give you a clear vision for where the entire piece is headed. 
This is actually a topic I explored in a recent video. So if you'd like to learn more on that process, I will go ahead and link that video up in the upper right hand corner. But all in all, if you are running into issues with a portrait you've been working on and your inclination is to fall into self-doubt, I hope this video has given you some reassurance because most often our issue isn't our ability or our potential to paint the things we want to paint, but rather that we simply aren't being set up to paint what we actually want to. We aren't being set up for success in the paintings that we're embarking upon, and that's a very solvable problem. If you enjoyed getting this kind of feedback, this is the kind of help that I give my students every day inside of my mentorship program. To find out more about how that works and to apply to see if we are a fit to work together, check out the link in the description for more info. All right, until next time, happy painting.